Welcome to Shaken Awake Podcast, the non sugar coated Christian podcast on the net. Sugar coating causes truth decay, which is why we here rely on the very word of God to dictate our direction and path in life that God has uh, set before us, not what the world or the man made doctrine or, the ne- or, or necessarily what the pulpit dictates. And I'm not here to tickle your ears, I'm here to share the words from God's word and provide you what He and the Holy Spirit have convicted me of and are pressing me to communicate out to you. And if you're a first-time listener, welcome aboard. And if you're a long-time listener, welcome and glad to have you back. And glad to have your ears and attention for just a few minutes to share what God has led me to share with you on uh, this episode. Without further ado, let's move on with Shaken Awake's 71st episode entitled, Do You Love God? And to answer that question, Question, we need to seek the word of God always. And here's what his word says. I'm taking this right from 1 Peter 1, 22 to 25 and 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. It says, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God, the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. And like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Okay, so what what should happen in the life of a believer who has truly believed and responded to the gospel? Well, in this passage, you know, Peter talks about the proper results of uh, salvation. And look what he says. He says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, that's 1 Peter 1.22. When he says we have purified by obeying the truth, he's talking about our salvation through faith in Christ. Peter seems to be calling our faith Obedience. God has called us to believe in the Son as our Lord and Savior, as it says in Romans 10, 9 through 10. And therefore, our faith is obedience. So it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's 2 Peter 3, uh, 3 9. God calls all men to repent so that may, they may be saved and those who respond are obedient. And this obedience to the gospel leads to purification. When we're saved, God washes us from our sins and cleanses us with the blood of Christ. Christ told the disciples, each one of them, were clean because of the word spoken to them. And it says that in John 15, 3. It was not only because they heard the word, but because they obeyed it. They obeyed and were purified by Christ's blood. And it says it uh, more on that in Hebrews 9.14. Hebrews 9.14 states, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So in this passage, Peter says, now what? What should be the result of our salvation? Some people get saved and uh, you know tend to continue to live their lives the same way they used to before accepting Christ. And for them, salvation is just fire insurance to keep them out of hell. And that I'm raising my hand right now. That was me, absolutely. However, uh, Scripture would say true salvation is not just mental acceptance without the corresponding works. 
true faith always leads to works, which which essentially proved you know the validity of our faith as it implies and it states plainly in James 2:17 it states clearly even so faith if it hath not works is dead being alone so also uh, so also faith if it's unaccompanied by obedience has no life in it so long as it stands alone so here's a big question what should be the result of a believer's salvation, according to 1 Peter 1, 22 to 25, and 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3. How should we apply these truths? And as a result of salvation, believers must love the brethren. That's that's uh, big. It's uh, 22 to 23 in 1 Peter 1 says, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brother, love one another deeply from the heart. For you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. So Peter says, as a result of our salvation is is love for the brethren. He, He demonstrates this by the word so in verse 22. It gives the purpose or um, uh, the, the result of something, right? So we should realize that loving believers is a fruit of true salvation. If a person who claims to be a Christian does not love believers, he is not truly saved, Look at what John says about this. 1 John 3, 14 to 15. We know that we have passed from life to death because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. John says anyone who does not love the brethren has not passed from a death to life. They are not truly born again and there's no life in them. Christ said the same thing. But not in referencing to us knowing we're saved, but the world knowing that we are. So look at what Christ Jesus says in John 13, 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So what should the believer's response to salvation be? The answer is to love the church. God has called you and I to love the church and honor him by that. In fact, he even more clearly says this is a, it's a result of our salvation in the following verse, 1 Peter 1, 23. And it says, For you have been born again, not of perishable sea, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Here's the next question that he answers. In what way should we love one another? How should how should believers love? Look again at verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart. So number one, believers should love like family. You know, when, when, when he says love for your brothers, the word he uses here is filio, or what's called brotherly love, right? It's a type of love that you give uh, to a family member. And we see this being taught about believers throughout the scripture. You know, remember what Christ said of his disciples when his family was trying to stop him from preaching. And he said, who are my mother and brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here, here. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Do you know? Did you know he said that? For those of you that read read the Bible, you you absolutely know that part. I remember the first like I, I'll never forget the first time I read that. I could I read it probably five times in a row. Never heard him talk like that. He ended with whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Wow, right. Mark 3, 33 to 35 says, when Christ said this, he began to exalt the family of God, even over natural family to some extent. So when his family was trying to pull him away from the crowd, he says, I have a responsibility to my spiritual family. That's what he's saying. Those who follow the ways of God. In fact, Paul taught Timothy this. This is, you know, how the church should function like a family. 
And listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1 to 2. I just read this the other night again. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, old, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Paul tells Timothy to treat older men as fathers in the church, to treat older women as mothers and younger women as sisters. So if your mom was in the hospital, you know, would you call and check in on her? If your younger brother was making some wrong decisions, would you not rebuke him in love? If you were trying to make a decision about the future, wouldn't you call your parents and, and seek some wisdom there? If you got in a fight with your family, won't you attempt with all your heart to work it out? This is how we treat people who are a part of our natural family. This is what Paul teaches every believer should do to one another as a result of salvation. Number two, believers should love one another sincerely without hypocrisy. Okay, the English word sincere comes from the Latin word sincera. You're going to love this, meaning without wax. So in ancient times when people would sell clay pots that had small cracks in them, they'd also, uh, you know, often would, would put wax on the cracks in order for them to appear new. And that, that kind of trickery is still going on today, right? The only way a person could really tell if, if it didn't have any wax was by putting the pot to the sky and, and allowing the sunlight to shine through it. And by doing this, you could tell if it was sin sera or without wax. So in, sincere in this text means to be honest, without ulterior mo uh, motives, so in the church, our love must be honest and without hypocrisy. Peter probably is reiterating this at the end of verse 22 when he says, from the heart. Much love in the church is not from the heart. It's hypocritical. It's two-faced. We shouldn't bless the pastors and members at church, but then talk bad about them at home. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Also, sincere love is, is never given with underlying motives in order to receive something from others. This would define most of the world's love. It's hypocritical. The world gives love for the purpose of receiving instead of loving simply to give. And when, 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 when people have, have served their purpose or no longer can benefit them, what do they do? They move on. It's not sincere. However, the believer's love should be sincere without wax. Number three, believers should love like God. The second love in verse 22 is the Greek word agape. It means to love like God, unconditionally and sacrificially. This is a very difficult challenge because agape is a love of the will. It's not necessarily a love of the emotions, right? God loved us while we were still enemies of his. Just like it states in Romans 5.10, he loved us when we were in rebellion. When we did things to hurt his glory, he loved us because that's who he is in, in, in his being. God is love, as backed up by uh, 1 John 4, 8. This love forgives our sins and it separates them as far as the east is from the west. In fact, the, the command to agape is really Christ's command to his disciples. Christ said, I give you a new command to love one another like I have loved you. That's John 15, 12. So to agape, someone means to even be willing to die for them. It's a sacrificial love. Remember what the early church did when they were first born again? The wealthy, they sold all they had in order to give to the poor in the church. You can find more on that in Acts 2, uh, verse 45. So that's a, sa a sacrificial love of the will. It, it's even shown to our enemies and, and to those who, who harm us. Like Matthew five forty four states, that's what it means to, uh, to agape. Our salvation should result in not only family love and sincere love, but agape love. And number four, believers must love 
passionately or, or deeply. So the final way Peter describes the love of a believer is with an athletic term. The word deeply or fervently, it's a, it's a term that means to stretch to the fur, furthest limit of a muscle's capacity. So metaphorically, the word means to go all out, to reach the furthest extent of something. So the believer's love for one another should be fervent. It should always be stretching itself. It should always be pushing itself to its capacity. So as a personal uh, or a former uh, personal trainer and and a non-professional bodybuilder uh, in the Army and afterwards, I believe the word uh, picture of a muscle stretching itself is a perfect, just a perfect analogy for love. So in training and being trained by someone with weights, it was our philosophy to always go to failure. So more, more specifically, muscle failure. This means that in each set, you lift the weight until you fail, which essentially means until the muscle says, I can't do even one more repetition. See, when you you take your muscle to failure, the muscle says to itself, I must grow, I must get stronger, or I must develop more perseverance in order to push this weight for an extended time period. So because of this, the muscle adapts to the stress by growing so it can be more effective in pushing the load in the future. Pretty cool, right? So it's the same with love. Love needs to always be stretched to its capacity in order to grow. Paul said in Galatians 6.2, carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. God often will be stretching your love in caring for a family member, like a sister or a brother who's struggling in the church. And yes, it's hard. Yes, sometimes we want to give up under the pressure. But as we stretch that love to capacity, God will equip you to love further and deeper. God's God's equipping you to love more like him. I would even say that many times heartbreak is just a door to love more. The flesh will respond to heartbreak by loving less and withdrawing. God often uses heartbreak and heart pain to deepen you know, that, that, that reservoir in our hearts so that God's love can more easily flow through us. And, and maybe you've been praying to be able to love God more or love your neighbor more. It's possible God's already developing this by stretching you to love someone who is difficult. It could be a friend, coworker. God may be using this quote-unquote hard time as a means to enrich your love and make it deeper. As Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Peter says our love should be sincere. It should be familial. It must be godlike and it must be deep or fervent. You know, someone might look at the command of love and say, yeah, it's just too difficult to do. How is it possible to love that way? So because of this, Peter reminds the believers again of their new birth and how they've been saved by the word of God. He describes the word of God as a seed. Inside a seed is great power. A seed may not appear that powerful if you just look at it. But if you put it in the ground, you water it and you give it sunlight, there is tremendous life in it. Just like the mustard seed, right? It can grow into a large tree with fruits that feed and bless many. It's the same with the word of God in our new birth. Peter mentions this to encourage believers with the power that's within them to love. Jesus said that no one can be born again except by water and the spirit of God. That's John 3, 5. So scripture often is pictured as water. Paul said that the husband should wash their wives with the water of the word of God. That's Ephesians 5.26. The word and the spirit come together in someone's life as they hear the gospel and they're changed. And then they're made new by the power of the spirit. So to be able to love as Christians are commanded is not something that comes through our flesh, through man's flesh, right? Man's flesh and glory is fading from the second we're born. The glory of man is like like the cherry blossoms, right? Here for today, gone for tomorrow. But the glory and the power of the word of God is eternal. This is how we've been saved and this is how we will love. It's through the power of this seed that has changed us. So let us remember what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 
5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has gone, the new has come. Romans 5.5 5 says, And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So we're a new creation in Christ. We have the Holy Spirit who's given us the power to love as God does. And look what scripture says about the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, such things, there is no law. Against such things, there is no law. So in the believer is this just tremendous capacity to love. This love is especially cultivated as we live in the spirit, just like Galatians 5.16 says, through time in the word, okay, prayer and fellowship, this is one of the ways that we can stretch and grow our love. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3. And the word therefore in 1 Peter 2, 1, it points us back to the previous verse. Peter is saying, get rid of all sin as a result of your salvation and because of the power of the word of God, that the, the, the imperishable seed that brought you the new birth. And because of this great work, get rid of sin and this cra- and crave the word of God that has changed you. The Greek word, by the way, used for rid yourselves gives us the picture of, of taking off clothes, right? Like in Acts 7.38. This image would have reminded them of the common practice in, in the ancient um, baptisms, right? So the new believers were instructed to wear, I think this is cool also, I, I love this. New believers were instructed to wear old clothes to their baptism and they would exchange them for white baz, uh, baptism robes. So after their baptism, they'd throw away those old clothes representing their old life of sin. And the word picture of throwing away clothes uh, of sin is used commonly by Paul. And he uses that same word in Ephesians 4.22, translated uh, to put off. So Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So one of the things we must do as believers is take off our old clothes and put on new ones. This is a continual process in the life of the believer, okay? We're, we're getting rid of old mindsets as we uh, renew our minds as it talks about just in Romans 12 too. We're changing our habitual practice of these certain sins in response to our salvation. In fact, the apostle John says that a change in our relationship to sin is a proof of our salvation, just as loving others is. Look at, look at 1 John 3, 6 to 8, okay? It says, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Whoever does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Okay, so John says that knowing God, being saved, will always change your relationship to sin. You cannot go on living the way you previously did. Therefore, a necessary step after salvation will be working to continually get rid of wrong attitudes and actions. It's, it's not being holier than thou. We'll never be completely free of sin, at least while we live here on this earth, but it will be our labor until we get to heaven. And in 1 Peter 1.22, this call to get rid of sinful attitudes and actions fits within the previous call to love. So if we're, we're gonna love our uh, brothers, we must get rid of everything that's uncharacteristic of love, right? 
Again, this makes perfect sense in the context of the believers in Asia Minor who were being persecuted. And when people are under duress, even the simplest things can can potentially start a conflict and begin a chain of a, a chain, chain of unloving actions. We see it every day around the world. So imagine these believers getting mistreated by their bosses, right? And having more work put on them because of their faith. Often when when one of them would come home, their patience would uh, be already spent. And so it it would affect his relationship with family and friends. And this pressure would even affect the relationship in the church. It may sound familiar to some of you. So when Israel was in the wilderness undergoing stress, what happened? They started pointing fingers at Moses and Aaron and God. They complained and they divided into groups. Do you remember that? If we're going to love, we must get rid of any divisive attitude or action. Malice is a general word for evil. It's generally directed at someone else. Deceit is the desire to trick or deceive someone for gain. Hypocrisy is to be two-faced and not genuine. Envy means to desire or be jealous of what someone else has. Slander means to defame someone's character or person through words, written or, in in today's uh, world, uh, technology. If you're going to love someone with God's love, these things are incompatible. In order to put on love and righteousness, you must take off some other things. So then, what are the necessary steps in the life of a believer in order to rid oneself of the sins that we see mentioned in 1 Peter 2.1? Here are some necessary steps that we have to practice to get rid of these sins. We must. One, recognize these attitudes and actions are sin. Two, confess them before God. That's 1 John 1, 9. Three, confess them before others. That's Matthew 5, 23, 24, also in James 5, 16. If we've slandered, deceived, or done evil towards someone else, that's me on all, all accounts, we would need to confess that to them. And number four, repent by forsaking these type of actions. Don't keep doing them. So it's good to remember that sometimes confession of sin before God's not enough. We must also confess to others. I just showed you where that was in the word of God. So listen to what Christ said. Matthew 5, 23 to 24. Listen to this. This blew my mind. This actually changed a couple courses of direction in my life a few years back when I first read this. Christ said, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there... Remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. Obviously, the gift was their way of um, uh, blessing God and and asking for forgiveness. He says, uh, uh, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. And I I remember reading that thinking, it, it is so important that we love and make right with one another, that Jesus has said, if you if you go to honor God and put your gifts at the altar and that and and and, and loving and forgiving and and combining um, and coming back to your brother is not yet done, that is more important. Go do that first. Put that first before I wouldn't say before God, but before those actions with God. It says it right there. Look it up. Don't take my word for it. Just like everything in these podcasts. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Please go read it. So, you know, to put off the clothes of sin means to um, to make things right. And for some, they, they just need to reconcile with people, not just God. So when we sin, again, we, we've offended God and we may have offended others. And if we've offended or harmed others, we must make reconciliation with them. And it should be noted that Jesus is not even talking about whether it was our fault or why the person is mad at us. It simply says, if your brother has something against you, go and be reconciled. Love's not about pointing fingers. It's about itself. It's about demonstrating love to someone else. Who who needed to hear that today? 
sometimes it stings, man. Truth stings. And as a result of our salvation, we must take the old clothes off our, uh, they're of their sin. It's sin. So as a result of our salvation, we must desire the word of God. Okay? I, I can't stress this enough. I said it in one of the episodes, if I had one last dying word to anyone, it would be read the entire word of God. I don't care how you do it, in order, backwards, the front, just read the entire word of God. Don't, don't rely on little snippets in church like you would a... Uh, something out of a fortune cookie little little pieces every now and again so it says first peter 2 2 like newborn babies craves pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the lord is good so here peter commands the believers to crave or desire the milk of the word of god like an infant it's, it's very interesting to me that peter doesn't say study the word of god read the word of god or even memorize it these things are commanded in other parts of the scripture, but here he focuses on the desire for it. If you really crave the word like a newborn baby, you will read, you will memorize, and you will meditate on it. It is the most natural thing for a believer to desire the word of God. It's one of the results of our salvation. Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's Matthew 4, 4. Job said, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. And that's Job 23, 12. And if you guys know that story of Job, um, wow, for him to say that uh, is, it's mind blowing. David in Psalm 119, he spends the largest chapter in the Bible primarily talking about his love for the word of God. Verse 77, your law is my delight. Verse 18, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. And, you know, how can a man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. That's verse nine. This is one of the things that happens, right, as a result of our, our spiritual birth. In the same way, a true believer loves other brothers, as in 1 John 3, 14, and seeks to get rid of sin and all his sins. That's 1 John 3, 6. A truly born-again person desires the word of God like a newborn. It says it in the Bible. That's why Peter puts this phrase after talking about our new birth throughout the word of God. So we've been saved by the word of God, and now we have to grow up into what Christ has called us to be through the word of God. He says, grow up in your salvation. So let me, let me be very clear on this. There's many Christians who never grow up. The, the church is full of spiritual babies that, that never reach maturity. Why is that? Because the primary way we grow is through the word of God. And it's, it's interesting to note that the, the Greek verb grow in this passage is passive. It literally meaning it may grow you. This means that as you study the word of God, it bears fruit in your life. It gets rid of sin. It helps a person walk in the righteousness that God made for them. However, However, the majority of the church never reaches spiritual adulthood and never bears the fruit that they've been called to produce. Why? Part of the reason is because they don't have a healthy desire. They don't enjoy studying the Bible. They don't enjoy hearing sermons. Why do so many Christians lack this desire? And if I'm talking about you, if the shoe fits, kick it off. So why are so many Christians lacking desire for the word of God? For some, it's because they never have been born again. There's a, there's a verse in the Bible that says, depart from me, I never knew you. Some of this has come, I have to believe some of this is behind those words. But on the flip side, on the, on the positive side, on the tickle your ears side, but this one's for good reason. I would say the opposite would be why he would say, well done, my good and faithful servant also. There's always two sides. Some Christians, you know, who've been raised in the church their entire lives have never truly desired the word of God at all. They've attended Bible studies, read the Bible of a necessity because they were made to, but they weren't never really craved it. I'm raising my hand. That was all me. Some of the church 
do not love the word of God because they're not saved. Listen to what Paul said about the non-believer, okay? 1 Corinthians 2.14. The, the, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Romans 8, 7 says, the sinful mind is hostile to, to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. That was me too, 41 years. The natural mind... The person without the spirit of God who has not been born again doesn't desire the word of God. He cannot truly understand it. It's foolishness to him. He doesn't have the capacity to obey God's word. But the believer does because he's been born again. So what about those who are saved? How come they sometimes uh, lose a desire for the word of God? A believer can lose a desire for the word of God because of sin. This is why in 1 Peter 2, 1, they're commanded to get rid of sin so they can desire the word of God. This makes sense. Did your mom ever tell you not to eat sweets before dinner because it would ruin your appetite? It's the same thing with sin. It's been said uh, that sin will keep you out of the word of God or the word of God will keep you out of sin. It's one or the other. James says the same thing. He says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. That's James 1.21. So we must get rid of sin so we can accept the word of God. If you're not in the word of God and you don't desire it, you can be sure that wrong attitudes have, have just crept into your mind and heart. Malice has, has showed up. There'll be some wrong attitudes toward, uh, toward God or wrong attitude, uh, attitudes toward others. But when the word of God is there, you will find that you have peace and a right relationship with not only God, but also others. And some have just lost desire for the word of God because of sin. Sin will ruin your appetite. Are you still desiring the word of God? So this is the proper response to one who has been saved by the what we what they call the imperishable seed of the word of God. How do we develop a healthy desire for the word of God? That's what a lot of people ask. How? Get rid of sin. That's number one. You got to get rid of it. It's going to quench your desire for the word. Right? I, I, I talked a lot, and if you have not heard my testimony, it's, the very first episode of this podcast back in, um, I think, February of uh, 2021. Man, time is flying. But I had this, such a desire to read the Word. I was often up until 2, 3, 4 in the morning and, and working a full time. I couldn't get enough. Word of God, sermons, I just couldn't get a, I couldn't. But um, I also had a drinking problem, and you'll hear a lot about that in my first episode. Anyway, I realized, well, I didn't. The Holy Spirit, I think, tapped me on the shoulder and um, made me realize I had still taken a, a drink or two. And I came to a point in a couple nights, right? Um, it's just that perfect time where I'd, pop one open and uh, I realized, I said, wait a minute, I'm, I'm really right now sitting here in front of a sermon or the word of God or, or uh, uh, um, something from Charles Spurgeon or just, just something. And, I, and I'm, 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 I'm literally sitting there pondering, should I read more, which I really, really want, or should I go to gra grab that bottle of beer? And, and so I, I made kind of a, I don't know how to call it, a spiritual game. What do I want? What's called, what do I want more? Wasn't what's behind door number one or two. I knew which, well, I knew what was behind each door. But I said to myself, what do I want? Behind number, uh, door number one, there's, there's Jesus, there's the word of God, and there's life. Behind door number two, there's alcohol, sin, and the devil who's trying to get me to decide that his way is better than God's way. And that's what helped me uh, take those last beers and throw them out and God rid them of uh, my life of them after almost 30 years of that. Um, but even at the end, it was still 
still sin trying to pull me away from the word. So two would be begin to force feed yourself the word of God. That's what the doctors would do, right? To any sick baby that hadn't eaten all day because they need to eat to live. The doctor will force feed a baby through an IV, make a plan and stick to it. Read the word of God. Listen to Job, right? Job said, I have, I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. That's Job 23, 12. Job desired the word more than food. And I read a story about a famous pastor named Derek Prince during just just a wild season of his life. He began to eat the word of God day and night, just like he would his meals. And this would only make sense for a person who desired it more than their daily meals. A normal diet is about three meals a day, okay? Daniel used to pray and meet with God three times a day. That's Daniel 6. Daniel said, seven times a day I pray, I praise you for your righteous laws. That's Psalms 119, 164. So when I used to be in a bodybuilding, I would eat six to eight meals and or you know protein shakes a day, which was about every two or three hours. Since the word of God is more important than food, reading the Bible multiple times a day is a valid spiritual discipline. It's not a command, but it's a valid, valid spiritual discipline. A better challenge might be, how can I practice meditating on the word of God all throughout the day? David talked about the blessing of the one who meditated on the word of God day and night in Psalms 1. Joshua was, was called to meditate on the word of God day and night as well as in, uh, in, in Joshua 1, many theologians believe that day and night, quote unquote, day and night, is not referring to, um, to the actual morning and night times. It probably was a liter literary device, meaning all day. It, this would be like Christ saying, forgive 70 times seven. It, it, it really meant just all the time, right? So the, the Bible declares there are tremendous blessings for the people who develop a lifestyle of this. God said that those who do in the book of Psalms and Joshua prosper in everything. So in conclusion, I was always amazed at at the story of those the 10 healed of, of, of leprosy in Luke chapter 17, 11 to 17. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 17. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, hang with me a couple more minutes, guys. I'm almost there, all right? As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. And as he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This, this man was a Samaritan, okay? Uh, they didn't usually get along. But Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Who are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Asked Jesus. And, and, you know, and Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Now, you, you may argue, but I'm led to believe it was a true story, but not about healing and thanks. It was much more and much deeper and much longer lasting than just what happened there that day. It's the perfect and realistic view of how professing Christians treat de Jesus in their day-to-day -day actions and in their hearts when forgiven of their sins and saved. Nine out of 10 go about their lives and live for themselves. And that one... The truly saved one thanks Jesus with everything he or she has in them and lives for Christ and not themselves, doing the will of the Father. And to give you a more current story that really just encompasses, the, it's the same take, takeaway as the one I'm going to end the show with. Here's that one last example. Let's see where you feel you stand on this, okay? A true story from the early 1900s. Um, it just it, it beautifully illustrates how Christians ought to be grateful for what Christ has done for them. So while on this three story, that's 30 feet high, scaffold at some uh, construction site one day, uh, that's in the early 1900s, a building engineer tripped and fell. 
uh, toward the ground and, and, and what appeared to be by witnesses to be a fatal fatal fall, right? Fatal plummet. And right below that scaffolding, a laborer uh, looked up just as the man fell. And he realized quickly that he was standing exactly where that engineer would land. And he braced himself and he absorbed that full impact of that other man's body. And that impact slightly injured the engineer, but severely hurt the laborer. The brutal collision, it fractured almost every bone in his body. And after he recovered from those injuries, he was severely disabled for life. So years later, a reporter asked the former construction laborer how the engineer had treated him since the accident. And the, the handicapped man told the reporter, he gave me half of all he owns, including a share of his business. He's, um, he's constantly concerned about my needs, and he never lets me want for anything. Almost every day, he gives me some token of thanks or remembrance. So this man responded by tremendous service to the person who, has, who had saved his life. So how much more should we respond to Christ who saved not only our bodies, but our souls? Here, Peter says the response of a believer to salvation should be one, loving other believers, two, getting rid of evil desires and actions like old clothes, and three, desiring the word of God. Are you still grateful for your salvation? And how are you responding because of its effect on your life? And I'll leave you with that. So thank you all for listening. And I pray this touched you in some way today. If so, please pass this forward. Also, please just take 10 seconds and just, you know, leave a review somewhere to help attract others to the show. Just search Google for Shaken Awake Podcast. Pick one that you like. This show is, is online everywhere from Facebook to YouTube to the website, Instagram. Uh, I, I just want the word spread as far as God will allow. Also, enter your email to subscribe and don't miss an another episode and check out any past show that you may have missed there's a there's lots to be uh, heard and used uh with the actual bible um for the show it's it's the only way to produce the fruit of the spirit if you apply it right um but thank you all for listening and we'll talk soon again god bless you and god bless everyone 